Just a few people out there know about the Android Auto integration with Samsung SmartThings and even if you do know about it, you're probably annoyed by the six device limit or the six thing limit. So for me, I have my smart home monitor a set of scenes and a couple of those groups that we created in the previous part of this series, but even that wasn't enough, so I had to find a workaround. If you have a second location in SmartThings, or a third, or all the way up to six different locations, well, then you can have six devices or six things per location. And you can simply navigate in Android Auto to switch between those locations, and therefore you'll have up to 36 different items, which doesn't seem like a big deal unless you're someone who owns a couple of houses, until you combine it with the rest of today's video. Hello automators, thanks for tuning in again. I'm Brian from Automate Your Life and today I'm going to take the frustration out of automation by helping you get more out of Samsung SmartThings with all of these hidden tips and tricks that you may or may not know about. Today's video is part of a at least five part video series that we're creating here on Automate Your Life to help you get more out of that system. But what you might find is that things are getting a little more complicated as we go throughout the series and they kind of build on each other. So if you're feeling a little bit lost, the links are all down below and you'll even see tutorials show up on screen with this little graphic whenever we have a tutorial video or a resource available for you to learn how to do something in a detailed way. Of course, if you need a little extra help, you can always ask down below and I'll get you pointed to the right video if you can't tell in those links below because I get that this will be hard to navigate. Now, Android Auto, if you're thinking about those six locations, well, it doesn't seem like it's gonna be that helpful unless you actually have those other homes. But it's already a pretty useful system when you think about being able to add and uh, disarm and arm your smart home monitor to that interface. This is one of the ways that you don't have to rely on that geolocation service that sometimes is problematic for people. Of course, you can include things like scenes and other devices within Android Auto, but one of those little features that's tucked away inside of that segment of the app is that when you're arriving or you're leaving, you can have these little notifications pop up on Android Auto to run a specific scene, and that can help set your home into the right status. But let me get to that little sneaky trick that could get you up to 36 different items on that tiny little Android Auto interface. You see, a lot of us use these other smart home platforms like Philips Hue or Yeelight or SwitchBot or other makers that integrate with Samsung SmartThings. I'm using TP-Link and I even pull in devices from the Smart Life or that Tuya platform into Samsung SmartThings and so I have a ton of these connected devices. Something that you might find interesting is that most of those platforms can actually be connected to multiple locations. And this is what I've done with a number of those services I just mentioned, including Philips Hue, which is connected to multiple locations in my Samsung SmartThings application. This in turn gives me the ability to switch between locations and have different devices showing up. Even if that location is still in the same physical location, Location, it doesn't matter. It's just giving you access to six more devices. Now at this point, I've been testing this for about a month and it's not necessarily going to be perfect with every cloud connected service. And what I'll tell you is that the EWI link service, it connected to multiple locations, but then it disconnected to whatever one I had done previously. So the most recent connected location stayed connected and that's an unfortunate part of that platform. But so far, every other thing that I've integrated has been fine on a couple of locations. Now what's funny about this is if you integrate Amazon and Google's voice assistants, that's not how they work. They actually integrate with all of your locations. So when you do this with some of the cloud connections, this has an effect of introducing extra devices that you might already have in your first location inside of SmartThings. 
But something happens that actually changes how these duplicate devices that you have work. And it actually might be beneficial for you to erase a lot of duplicate devices. So what happens when you integrate at that point with Miss A or the Google Assistant is that the devices brought in actually append the name of your home on the front end of your devices. Now, this is only happening with devices that have duplicate names, so it's not everything coming from Samsung SmartThings, but if you have a duplicate of the device, so say Philips Hue, well now you will get the home name on the front and then the name of the device. This would allow you to quickly and easily organize, throw those all into a single group and then disable them if you didn't want them to be used. Plus, you're gonna get two versions of that. You're going to get from each of your two locations or three locations, and you're going to be able to organize those separately, which would allow you to control them in different groups inside of those voice assistants. Now, I have to tell you that you have to watch out for this one because as you duplicate in smart things, you're duplicating lots in Amazon and Google. So just watch out, it can get out of hand really quickly and you can create yourself a bit of a job to do, but this is still a really interesting trick that you can then use in a lot of different ways with those voice assistants. Speaking of devices, you know what? One of the biggest mysteries here with Samsung SmartThings is when AOTech will actually release all of their sensors that go along with their version of the smart home hub. We have experienced years and years of relatively inexpensive devices from Samsung, so it would be great to get that back. However, it looks like number one, AOTech has been affected by the pandemic and the overall shortages of electronic components in the world right now. And I keep seeing their listings show up and then disappear. And number two, unfortunately, it looks like the prices are a little bit higher than we were expecting, sometimes upwards of 50% more than the Samsung version of the same device. Now this means that as a community, we have to start finding those cheaper devices or find other options for us. And that's why I've been creating some of the guides that I have related to device types uh, and working with Samsung SmartThings. One of the ways that I research which devices are available for those kinds of videos is actually by pretending that I'm adding a device inside of the SmartThings app. Now, what I do is I go to search by device type and then when you tap in there, you will see a list of the brands that have products that are that device type and work with Samsung SmartThings. And I got a question the other day from someone who had actually called Samsung or talked to their support team. And what this individual said was that they had been told by Samsung support that they no longer supported a certain manufacturer's device and he couldn't get them working and so he couldn't get any help. And there's actually something here that will tell you a little bit about that support situation before you go out and buy a product. See, it wasn't that the device doesn't work with SmartThings because I actually came back and said, hey, these products are still working for me and they're still working in my home. But once he had a problem, he couldn't get any support from that because when you actually go in and pretend you're gonna add one of these devices, you'll see a couple of different situations. There's the certified to work in your area or the compatible but not certified. And when it's compatible but not certified that's when you might run into this situation where the smart thing support staff can't help you and you have to go to the manufacturer or the vendor and they may or may not be able to support you one thing I always check before I buy a product for smart things is what specific devices a brand supports which you can check by adding a device by brand and then tapping on the supported devices button to see a list However, the list of devices inside of the application is not complete and it would be pretty hard for me to just go, hey, here's a complete list of the devices unless I was actually Samsung or AOTech, both of which have created some pretty good resources for us. 
SmartThings.com has a pretty good list as well. And actually what this can help you to see is some devices that aren't showing up in the app, they might either not be available in your country or not be certified to work in your country. And there's a good example of this for me. I can see within the list of cameras on the SmartThings.com website, a company called Imilab, which have created the 360 camera that we've seen uh, SmartThings kind of showcase or deploy and then never actually release themselves. So that device shows up in that list. And AOTech has a list that you can check the link down below. It's a really comprehensive list as well. And what I actually found it pretty useful for was finding some of those Smart Life products. Now it's not a huge list of those devices that's available there, but it's the most I've seen on any single list. And I think that's a big component of Tuya compatibility or Smart Life compatibility. Those two terms I'm gonna use interchangeably here and they're really the same thing. So when we're talking about devices that work with Smart Life or in the Globe application and whether or not they work with smart things, the one thing I want you to check other than that AOTech list is that the product listing actually says it's compatible with smart things. Otherwise you're buying a device that likely will not integrate because companies that purchase devices or create devices uh, with the Tuya platform actually have to pay an extra fee in order to get smart things compatibility. And what you'll find is in general, certain vendors will pay that fee in order to get their products working with smart things. One of the little details about including Tuya or Smart Life devices in Smart Things is that your scenes will come across, but you'll find that you can't turn them on in the app by pressing the button. Instead, use a Smart Things automation to turn on Smart Life scenes. You can see with this product listing of a smart plug from a company called Tekken that they specifically state smart things compatibility. That's what you want to see before you go heading down the path of thinking you can integrate a product. Now, I will tell you a little trick here, and that is that many of the Tekken products actually do integrate with smart things, and especially their newer ones as they have paid for that compatibility. But that's a lot of the Tuya devices that I've managed to bring into smart things. Now, one of the things that didn't come across from that product listing is the power monitoring capability. You're not necessarily getting all of the features, but they will exist in that Smart Life app or in whatever app that you're using. And speaking of power monitoring, this is actually something that I don't see used a ton inside of Samsung SmartThings, and it can actually save you a ton of money in a number of different ways. Now, I said those tech and smart plugs didn't bring in the power monitoring capability. I could just turn them on or off, but I do have a couple of options for you, including this smart plug from Fabaro, which actually has an additional USB port, and the AOTech Smart Switch 7. These types of devices mean that I can do a couple of different automations that I find really useful. The first one is based on what's called the power meter, which is the instantaneous draw or exactly what's being pulled through the smart plug at the moment and that helps you to eliminate in a lot of cases phantom power draws that are going on once you've turned off your device. The other type is overall energy consumption and this tends to build over a month on the device and then you can kind of see how much you're spending on that device in watt hours and that's something you'll see on your power bill usually in kilowatt hours and then you'll see a cost for the power up at that level. Using the energy consumption side of things, I can make sure that if a device is costing me too much money over the time period of a month that I can actually turn it off and stop it from spending my money. With both of those plugs, I have found the power meter to be really useful on that phantom power side of things. And I'll tell you, I did a calculation very conservatively here, and I would say that I'm going to save more per year by doing this, but very conservatively, just by attaching the Fabaro smart plug to my entertainment center, 
I am saving $20 a year just by identifying the difference in level. So what I did was I turned on the entertainment system and I turned on all my devices and I could see how much power was being drawn through the Fabaro plug. Then what I did is I turned off the TV and any other devices and then that allowed me to see exactly how much it would pull in phantom power. And then I did a simple calculation that told me it was easy if once I turned off that TV that I just turned off the whole system and then turned it on whenever I wanted to use it that I was gonna save $20 a year. But one of the things that gets me with these power monitoring devices is that within the automations, I can't delay the trigger of something. I can't check if it's been running at that lower level for an extended period of time. So if you have devices that kind of float up and down quite a bit, you might find yourself tripping incidentally or when you don't want to. However, on the action side with any sort of smart plug and almost every device that you have inside of Samsung SmartThings, you can delay that action side. So what you can do is actually put devices in sequence and that would really help you for turning that whole system back on as you had IR devices that needed to be turned on or other smart plugs in the area that needed to be turned on. You can actually run them in a sequential order based on a single trigger. One of the things I was experiencing when I was trying to power back on that entertainment center is that it wouldn't necessarily be above the 50 watt threshold that I had set for that entertainment center. Now, what you can do with that is you can add this little status to make sure that that smart plug has been on for at least a minute. And that would give you a minute to start turning on some of those other devices and get above that 50 watt threshold. That's a little trick that's very important when you're trying to create automations like this. And delays are such an underused component of automations. And I'm gonna give you a quick little example here. I have a Sono speaker inside of SmartThings and I can use that to play music from a number of services. Now, one of the things that you often wanna do is just to hear what's going on in your house when you're playing music or you just need a quick pause. And what you can actually do is create a little automation that when you mute that speaker, which you could do in a number of ways, including automations or including through voice assistance, then you can actually have it unmute a minute later. And this would give you the ability to have that little bit of muted pause. Which brings me to one of the great things about motion sensors, including some cameras, door sensors, tamper sensors, vibration sensors, leak sensors, lights, most switches and plugs, and a few other device types that I'm sure you'll find now that you'll be looking for this feature. All of those devices can be used with a delay on the automation trigger side of things. So this is the if side of your automations. And what that means you can do is actually eliminate a lot of those too sensitive devices that are picking up things every so often that you don't want a notification about or you don't want an automation to run. You can actually add that little bit of delay and recheck the device after that. And there are a ton of other device tips and tricks that I have, but in order to get to those, we're gonna have to do some bigger and better integrations. And that's what the next part of our five part series here is all about. So check out the video that's up on screen now. Otherwise, thanks for watching today. And of course, don't hate, automate.